So next up, our friend Ed Havich. I love it. He comes here with a with a really typically Ed subtle title called Doctrine of Demons. He shows up with a shirt that says Doctrine is not a dirty word and it's a it's a red shirt. Ed, come on up. Yep, That's, there it is tall enough. It is a little good. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for my brother Ed and his ministry. Uh, we pray that you lead him now as he uh, discusses the doctrine of demons, and uh, we pray that your spirit rests he heavily upon him as, uh, as he speaks to us. We give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Everybody can hear? All right, great. Um, I had a, a moment uh, just a little, uh, just a while ago when I noticed that Mim's husband John died. I did not know that. That hit me like a punch in my chest. I love John, he encouraged me, and I looked forward to seeing him and I actually walked in here today, saw Mim, and I just assumed John would be here. Which brings me to, I didn't mean to start off so sober, but it did sober me up, so I don't know where this message is going to end up. When I first come to this conference in 1979, I was in my mid-twenties. And I had hair. It has gone fast, very fast. We're not getting any younger. This is the group, this probably most of us are the group, the first wave that came out of Walter Martin. I was inspired by Walter Martin as many of you were. And it's sobering to me that time is passing. I want to finish well. So the rest of my life, whatever that consists of, I'm 67, I'll be 68 in a few weeks, is just going to be a run to the finish line. I tend to go fast. I can give, a, I can give an hour uh, talk in about 10 minutes. So I, uh, I, am, I have been slowed down uh, just by uh, just reflecting on, on things going on. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is from my own experience and piggybacking on what Jason says, there'll be a lot of overlapping things. I learned a lot of things in this conference over 40 years, a lot. I've met a lot of remarkable people. One of the things that we do as, as counter cult is we go beyond what most people do. And I remember somebody speaking about pastors. Um, I don't know who, who made that comment, but pastors do not get it. They do not understand that they have to prepare their congregation on Sunday for that knock at the door on Monday morning. My testimony, and okay, this is gonna this is gonna morph into doctrines of devils or doctrines of demons, I promise you. I come out of religion also. Every one of us in this room has been touched by religion. And religion, it can be good, and it can be not so good. There are, there's an old adage that says, there are two ways to keep from thinking. Believe everything and deny everything. Religion will have you believing everything. And once it gets done with you, it will cast you to the side, and you will believe nothing. You will go from one pillar to a post, and you will stand there defiantly believing that you have had the truth, you rejected it, and now you are moving on. I know people who have, who have, who have walked and now are just cursing. There's, there's a lot of ways to interpret things. And when you get into religion, religion wants you to do a lot of different things. I remember a young pastor 
had a young, young man in his congregation, and I've told this story before, so forgive me if you've heard it before. And he noticed that the young man was wearing odd clothes. And he said one day he'd walk in and the kid would have on pants didn't fit him, shirt oversized. Next day he'd come in and the kid would have on a shirt that was so tight that he couldn't move. Finally he couldn't stand it and he said, son, he said, why don't you wear clothes that fit you? He says, I can't. Why not? Because the Bible says to have nothing to do with a medium. <laughs> Young man wanted to go and find a church. And he said, I'm going to look. And he said he had, a, he had this ecumenical idea that all churches preached pretty much the same thing. So he was driving around and he was looking for a new church. Come across the church and on the front it said, all denominations are welcome. He said, that's the church for me. He went inside and he found out, indeed, all denominations were welcome, but they preferred 20s and 50s. <laughs> I know, these are corny. Not any corny than Norm Geisler would tell, but they drive home the point of what doctrine is and how people arrive at it, how people get to that. A doctrine is defined as the, the codification of beliefs or a body of teaching or instructions, taught principles or positions as the, as the body of teachings in a branch of knowledge or a system, belief system. Briefly put, doctrine is the formalization formalized expression of a foundational belief. Even our friends who are in the unbelieving camp will bristle at the idea of knowing that their pontification that there is no God is in, in fact also a doctrine. And it is a doctrine of a demon. Now how do we get to, 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 to sound doctrine? We are now approaching a time when everything is shifting. The whole landscape of religion is shifting from one pillar to post. You like that pillar and post illustration? It is moving. 40 years ago, it was easy to be in counter cult. Jehovah's Witnesses stayed Jehovah's Witnesses. Mormons stayed Jehovah's, or Mormons. Uh, everybody stayed the way they were. The doctrines were pretty much cut and dry. You knew who we were dealing with. Now. It is because of the internet and because of YouTube, which Brother Vino calls the new Mars Hill. <laughs> you can make up your own. It's like a smorgasbord. You can pick up a little of this, a little of that. You can lay down and you can still be a spiritual person. The new thing is being spiritual. But it means a whole lot less or a whole lot more depending on who you're talking about. So... <clears throat> What do we need to do? We need to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen that need us not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the, 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 the word, of, word of truth. Remember what Jose said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 29, backs it up in Mark chapter 12, verse 24. He, uh, he goes, <clears throat> my people are, are uh, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. All error begins with ignorance of God's word. But yet I meet so many people in my Sunday school class, in the church that I go to, that do not know, do, do not know doctrine. And doctrine has become a dirty word. It's, it's something like work. People have a very um, different idea of what it means to be saved. I usually tell people, and I, I shock people when I tell them this, I do not want to go to heaven. And they look at me kind of awed, and I said, I don't want to go. I said, my joy and my desire is to be with Christ. I don't want to go to heaven. I want to be with Christ. And now if that's in heaven, that's where I want to be. But my, my desire is not to be in heaven. 
Heaven was never the message. It's never the message now. The message is Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So attacks are coming in from all sides. And in our mind, our mind sometimes looks like a triage center. It's coming in from the left. It's coming in from the right. We are now beginning to see an onslaught because of political involvement where, the, where they want to make the Bible a totally secular, or, or America, a totally secular um, country. They want to turn us into a society in which uh, religious beliefs are kept quietly, that, um, that, that you could be, in the next several years, you could, it could be against the law to even carry one. It's coming fast. There's legislation on the books right now that's being considered to have the Bible banned as hate literature. Certain parts of the Bible are already forbidden to be spoken because it elicits hate. It's here. It's coming. We, thought, we didn't think this would ever happen, but it's here. It's here. Religion cannot give you what it doesn't have. So when we talk about religion and we talk about a relationship with Christ, we're talking about something very, very different. The Bible does talk about religion, but it talks about it in a very different way. Religion will never give you what it can't have. Religion gives you a path. That's all it gives you. It gives you a path. A path to something that you will never arrive at. And it's a hard taskmaster, as some of you know. I grew up in the Disciple of Christ Church. And... For most of you who don't know Disciple of Christ, we're the denomination that gave you Jim Jones. We, bapt, we, uh, we ordained Jim Jones. I always thought that as long as you were a good person, the good person being the object and being the desired result, it didn't matter what you believed, as long as what you believed caused you to become a good person. Now, that's part of what religion does. Part of what religion says, okay, anything goes. There's another side of religion that says, no, it's our way, and it is completely our way because there is no highway. It's our way. With Christ, we begin. With, with, with Christianity and with the relation with Christ, we begin. We begin where we end. We, we arrive the moment we begin. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ right now. Amen. I am on my way. I have confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I have believed in my heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And as a result of that commission, confession, I have passed from death unto life. My calling and my election has been made sure, 2 Peter 1.10. And I now can say that if before this carcass, my carcass hits the floor, I will be absent from the body, I will be present with the Lord. Now, where do we begin to, to get this idea of, of, of defending ourselves against doctrine? Well, it begins with the Bible. How many remember, um, um, I'm thinking of Guy Lombardo, that's not Guy Lombardo, it's um, guy with the, the Packers. No. Vince Lombardo. Vince Lombardo. You remember when Vince held that football up and he said, this is a football. Sometimes I, I will raise my, my Bible up and I will say, this is a Bible. Let's begin there. Now the Bible has many, many interpretations. I mean, I'm sorry, many different translations. There's a lot of them, and some of them don't even qualify as a translation. It has three languages and over a period of 1,500 years. Now, it's useful to know some of this information, but this is not what I mean by knowing the Bible. The Bible is divided into two testaments. Most people know that. Most people know that the, book, the Bible has 66 books. Most people know that. But it's also helpful to go a little bit further. Okay, there is 11, 1,189 chapters in the, in the Bible. There's also 31,102 verses. 
Now, I had an individual one day, his name was Lonzo, and he was marching up my, my, my driveway. And on his, and he had this little card in his hand, and he gave me a card. And on that card it said, it had Acts 238. I said, Lonzo, I said, there's 31,102 verses in the Bible. I said, why is this one on your card? And of course, if you, if you, if you talk to Brother Jody back here, you will know that that verse indicated that not only do you have to be baptized in Jesus' name to be saved, but it is an anti-Trinitarian statement because there is no other, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all names of Jesus. Well, he couldn't answer the questions that I asked, so I asked him to pass me on to his pastor. Now, there are 700, 783,137 words in the King James Version. There are 3,116,480 letters in the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> Esther chapter 9, verse 8 is the longest verse. And John chapter 10, verse 35 is the shortest verse. This is what we learn in Bible school. We think we're learning the Bible. Until somebody knocks on our door. Good morning. They don't care how much you know about the Bible. We have general knowledge about the Bible. And I've told you this story before. I had an individual who, um, who came to me and um, and I, I shared this at the Missouri conference, who knew about everything about Obama. He knew about Obama's birth. He knew where Obama went to school. He knew Obama's friends. He knew everything about Obama. Now this is in a church that he's telling me about this. Obama, Obama, Obama. So finally I listened to everything he knew about Obama. Good morning, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. We're in your area, we'd like to share some verses with you. Do you mind, do you have some time? No doubt you're a Christian. Yes, I am. You must believe the, uh, the Trinity. Yes, I do, I do. Uh, do, you know, do you know where in the Bible? No, I don't. I said, Jehovah's Witnesses are on your door. I said, give me a defense for the Trinity. He said, I can't. He said, brother, you're studying the wrong thing. I am politically homeless. I know very little about politics. But the thing I want to know is how to answer questions about people who were in front of me who were attacking the Bible. And they all come down along certain lines. When you, get, when you, get, when you, when you take the first thing that we need to do, and I've got a list of these things right here, and I'll, I'll pass these out, is the Bible is under attack. Now, it's under attack in a number of ways. It's under attack because they're attacking its origin, its transmission, and its content. But it's also under attack when you have groups that are coming to you and saying that they're, you can't understand it without or organization. That's also an attack on the Bible because it's basically saying that you're an idiot. And you need our group in order to guide you through this. Now, salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. But there are a lot of organizations that also claim that the Bible is important, Jesus is <clears throat> intricate, but you need to belong to our, our organization to be saved. Roman Catholicism teaches this in the Catholic Catechism in section 846, 847, 848. Extra Ecclesium Nulla Salus, which is Latin, which is... Uh, Jason probably already knows what this means. It means outside the church. There is no salvation. Salvation is an organizational concept. Mormons believe this. On page 670 of Mormon Doctrine, it says there is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I wrote to the Christadelphians and I said, is it true that you guys believe that you're the only true church on the earth today? And they said, yes, that's true. That's very true. And of course, we know that Jehovah's Witnesses believe this. Uh, Watchtower of November the 15th, 1981, page 21. 
you must come into Jehovah's Organization for Salvation. March 1st, Watchtower, 1979, page one, come into Jehovah's Organ, uh, put faith in a, in, in a victorious organization. December the 15th, Watchtower. December the 1st, Watchtower, 1981, page 27, uh, you, must, uh, you must study with Jehovah's Witnesses. You will not progress along the road of life, no matter how much Bible learning you do, if you're not in touch with this organization that God is using. I was at a county fair not too long ago, and um, I was at a county fair not too long ago, pardon me, and uh, they, they set up a booth, and they're, they're, they're very good and very zealous about sharing the gospel, and I love them for that, and I promote them, but they're not really good at answering questions. So I said, if you have a tough case, I said, you know, that's down here, I said, give me a call. So they have me on speed dial. So I'm at the fair and I'm having a good time at the fair and I get a call. They said, Ed, get down here quick, we've got a, we've got a live one. We've got a Jehovah's Witness down here and she's holding court. And I said, I'm on my way. So I made my way through the, I made my way through the fair and I got down there and indeed she was. She was holding court and she was, a, she was a little lady. And um, so this is the problem that I had. How do I get into a conversation that's already been well established? And here I am, I'm a new player. I got there, she's ready to leave. She's been there for a half an hour and she's just, she's just dusting everybody. And uh, so I arrived and I said, can I ask you a question? No! <laughs> I said, can I ask you a Bible question? All right. I said, is it true in your organization that the Bible is a sealed book except to the or your organization? And she said, I don't know why you people continue to say that. I said, well, I have the photostats over here. And I said, because um, I, I made a, in, in anticipation Jehovah's Witness would show up the booth because they always do. Them and atheists are the only ones who really come around. And I said, I said, let me ask you, I said, why? I said, do you believe, do you believe that? And she said, how do I even know that those are watchtowers officials? I said, well, I was hoping you would have enough going for you to know that that's your literature. But I said, do you believe that the organization is necessary to understand the, the bio? That's, that's in the July the first watch, July the first watchtower, 1973, page 402. I said, "Do you believe that?" And uh, she she tried to dodge that. And I said, "Well, let me ask you another one." I said, "This isn't even an older one, but I said it's important." I said, "Do you believe that Jehovah? You believe Jehovah is your father?" Yes. I said, "Do you believe the organization is your mother?" And that's in the May the first Watchtower, 1957, page 274. You must not only have Jehovah as your father, but you must have the organization as your mother. And um, she did. She did agree that the organization was her mother. And uh, so we talked a little bit more, and finally uh, we we begin to go through what what salvation was, and to give them the opportunity. And this is what happens many times. Like what Jason said about. You know, as, as a police officer, you know, truth will just crush you. Um, can you give me or can you show me where in the Bible there is the justification that I need your publications in order to understand the Bible? Where, is the say, where does it say that? Because a lot of organizations do teach that, that the Bible is closed except to the esoteric language and, and uh, teachers that we have that can guide you through this the morass of, of a very difficult passage because you will never get to the point where Jesus is the one and only. He, we are saved by grace, uh, saved by faith through grace, through Jesus alone. He is alone. The, uh, the, only, in, the only thing that we need for faith and salvation. We have arrived. It's not a path. We have arrived. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest or Sabbath. We rest in Christ. Everyone in this room who knows Christ is resting in Christ. It's not religion. Religion just simply introduces you to a path that says, 
get busy and get going, and we'll tell you when and if you arrive. Which, of course, those of us, or those of you who, are, who have traveled the path, knows that there is no end to the path. And you are introduced to this monkey on your back the entire time you're going that pulls and pulls and says, you haven't done enough, you haven't done enough. So the origin of the Bible and speaking about the Bible becomes important. We have to establish that the Bible is authoritative. So the attacks along the Bible are going to come. The first, the first attack is going to be the origin. They're going to attack the origin of the Bible. I was in a Hare Krishna temple not a couple of weeks ago. And um, during, during that time, I was, there was all the stuff. I, I, I would love to have put it up here. I'm, one day I'm going to know how to do all this technology. But um, in, this, in this thing, they, they were bringing in Lord Jagannath. And it was just a, it was just a, it was just, I mean, it was just a cacophony of just everybody just chanting to, to, to Lord Krishna. And it was going on. So on the side, on the side, on the wall, there was this mural of the cycle of birth and death. By the way, this is about demons. Okay, this, this one will remind you. And a lady from Trinidad approached me. And she said, um, she asked me what, what, what I thought. Because obviously I looked like a gringo. I looked like somebody who didn't belong there. And um, I said, this picture here, I said, this picture fascinates me. I said, the, the whole cycle. I said, there's only one problem. I said, there's no bugs in it. There's no bug. She said, what do you mean there's no bug? I said, well, according to the Eastern view, Western view, I said, you can only cycle as human beings. But I said, according to the Christian view, I said, you can come back as a bug or a slug or my dog, Doug. And I said, I want to see where in this thing you can cycle back as a bug. And... Uh, so, just like the book of Acts 17, it came alive immediately at that moment. She began to attack the first thing. What do you think the first thing? Now, we're talking about reincarnation. We're talking about the cycle of life. I just asked her a question. I just asked her a question about the validity of coming back as a bug or a slug or my dog, Doug. What do you think the first question out of her mouth was? It will shock you, because it shocked me. She said, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus says, I am God. <laughs> that was the first question she asked me. Okay, in a context, I reached into my, butt, into my, into my bag. And of course, I have an iPad, and I opened the Bible, and we began to go through the scriptures that showed, pretty much like what Jason did, that Jesus was God. Reasoning with her out of the scripture. From there we shot into the Bible is full of contradictions. And then we went, and okay, this was a segue, man. This was, I mean, she's caught on this thing. She didn't, want, she didn't like that. But knowing how to do that, so I'm, I'm, I'm challenging every one of us, most of us, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I know that. But to those of you who are new to this, know how to begin and show comprehensively, or as far as you can go, that Jesus Christ is God. Now, the, the Islam will challenge us by saying, nowhere does Jesus ever say, I am God. That seems to be their litmus test. If it was not propositionally stated, then it's not true. But we need to know how to begin and take them from point A to point B. Well, she knew that she was losing this discussion, and she immediately shot into a, uh, to a content question, which was, well, okay, well, where did, it, where, did, where, did Eve get her, um, where did Eve get her husband? Now, this is in the midst of a celebration of Lord Jagannath. I am standing in a Krishna temple with a Bible opening, reasoning out of it with a lady from Trinidad, who Jesus was, and answering Bible difficulties. I loved it. 
I was soon passed on up. Evidently, she too believed in, uh, in, in Acts 7. She, pro she probably read 17, 18 because, um, you know, where Paul was called a babbler. So when you enter into these discussions, understand with all the intellect, with the calling, and with the pedigree that the apostle ha Paul had, and can you imagine his ability to lay down the gospel? Somebody said, you're a babbler. Oh my gosh, I haven't got a shot. <laughs> I mean, the apostle Paul's called a babbler, I ain't got a shot. So we want to know, we, we, we have to know that the Bible is the word of God. And we have to know how it was put together. Now there's a, there's a number, of, I'm not, not going to get through all this. I'm just going just gonna to wing it. Um, <clears throat> either that or I'm going to go into Ed Havich mood and, and just, yeah, I'll give it to you all in 10 minutes. The transmission of the Bible, because this is where our doctrinal stand us. This is how we identify what, 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 what demon, demonic doctrine is. And that is the transmission. How do we know that there are only 66 books? Because you're going to get this when you begin to give. And especially now with all the shifting that's going on. There are people, like I said, 40 years ago it was easy to be a Christian or uh, an apologist because everybody stayed put. Now people are leaving, man. The landscape is changing and there's this thing going on called blending. And the people who are in these groups are now leaving them, but as they're leaving them, and we went to the Reason Valley, and we sat down with people who are atheists, and they are former Jehovah's Witnesses, former Mormons, former Christadelphians, former Disciples of Christ. They are former religionists who are now embracing a, an atheistic paradigm. But the interesting thing is, is when you witness to them, they reach back into a doctrinal paradigm that they came out of and argue against what the gospel while defending atheism. I've never seen anything like it, and nor was I ever prepared for it. But I had a great time in Washington, D.C. at the Reason Rally when 15 to 20,000 uh, uh, atheists showed up. And we walked around and we just witnessed to them out of the scriptures who Christ is. We are in a situation where everybody now who lives in America, I haven't come across anybody who says I haven't heard of Jesus, but I have come across a lot of people who have perverted the name of Jesus. So be on the lookout for that. So, so origin is very, very important. The reason why there are only 66 books in the Bible because that's all Jesus, that's all, the, that's all that was inspired was 66. Know how to defend that. And you have to have ready uh, answers. So you're telling me that, uh, that, that there's only 66 books in the Bible that were, yes, I'm telling you. Well, what about Nicaea? What about Nicaea? Well, Nicaea was not when the Bible was put together. That's 397, that was Carthage. Uh, 3, 325 is a different uh, uh, council. So they're gonna get this mixed up. They're gonna get the councils mixed up. You've got to have beginning places in your mind and in your response of where to begin, and you, me too, need to con control the narrative. You need to practice this. And you're saying, well, I don't want to practice. I just want to be spontaneous in the spirit. No, 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 can't do that. Just like in an Olympic, we are training, every one of us in this room are training for the next encounter. We need to go home. And in our private time, start com committing this stuff to scripture. We need to know what's under attack and we need to know how to defend and respond to it. We need to take control of the narrative when we're under attack, not sit there picking ourselves up the floor trying to think, oh my gosh, what do I say next? Where, where do I go from here? We need to say, boom, I'm on it. We got it. And it begins by studying to show ourselves to, uh, uh, to be approved. Now. The Trinity is probably one of the most, if not the most, attacked scripture or, or concept in Christendom. And I'm probably not going to have time to get through it, but I'm going to do my best. Okay. I was in a Sunday school class not too long ago. And they were discussing the Trinity. Well, my eyes, my ears perked up because I, I know a little bit about it. Because 
I have defended it. I have dialogued with it for 40 years. So one of the guys down in the front said, he raised his hand, and, well, the teacher, the, the, the leader of the class said, can anybody give me a, 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 an explanation of the Trinity? Yes, Bob. Well, the Trinity's like water. It's like um, vapor, liquid, and gas. Bob, that's very good. That's a very good explanation. Anybody else? Yes, Mary. Uh, the, the, no, the scripture, I, I, the one I use is, I use the egg illustration. You know, the, the, the Trinity's like an egg and a, and a yolk and a, and, and a shell. Oh, that's good. You must, you must, that's a really good way to do that. Yes, over here. No, no, I use the apple illustration. You know, the, the, you know, the stem and the, the, the white part and the red. So I'm, I'm sitting back there and my heart is beating. Because I know I'm going to raise my hand, I'm going to be next. And they're going to know there's fungus among us. <laughs> yes, Ed. Well, you know, back 40 years ago, I used to use those illustrations. I used the water illustration, and when I did, they told me I was all wet. I used the egg illustration. They said, Ed, you are cracked. I used the apple illustration. I said, Ed, your illustration's fruitless. So I said, there's got to be a different way in order to present the doctrine of the Trinity. And as I, the number one misunderstood, as Jody talked, Jody, Jody's gonna unpack this even far more than I do, but the number one attack doctrine, we need to know this, we need to know where to begin. I use a biblical approach because it's the only one I know, and it's better than the water, the egg, and the apple. One of the things that you will have a difficult time with, and everybody who's ever discussed or defended or debated this, this particular doctrine is to establish that yes, we only believe in one God. And sometimes when I d dialogue with, uh, with Islam, they will say to me, I want you to describe your God without using the number three. Show me how we, we talk, you guys, you, you Christians, you start out talking about one God, and then you end up talking about three, one is three, three is one. You know, you guys are confused, very confused, and um, uh, it is just better to believe um, that there's only one God without trying to squeeze all this other nonsense in there. So we have to know that there's only one God. Now, you need to be able to begin with a litany of scriptures that says that God is one. How many can do that right off the bat? Give me a number, give me five. I know there's probably, uh, I, in this room, I, I'm preaching to the choir. In Deuteronomy, there are four. Deuteronomy 4.35, Deuteronomy 4.39, Deuteronomy 6.4, and Deuteronomy 32.39. 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, 2 Samuel 22.2, 22, 20, uh, 2, 2, and 2 Samuel 22.29, uh, 32. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Um, Psalm chapter 18, verse 31. Just go through them. There is only one God. Reiterating as you go. Isaiah is full of them. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 and 8. Isaiah chapter 45, 5, 6, 18 and 21. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. New Testament. Mark chapter 12, verse 31, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, and 2 Timothy 2, 5. Yes, we only believe in one God. Establish it, establish it, establish it. Drive a tent peg deep. Now it comes into, there are three persons who are called God. This is a very systematic way, and it is scripture. Scripture carries with it its own conviction. So we know that the Father is called God, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Galatians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23, and Jude chapter 1. We need to be able to go, and this is, and Jason's went over, Jason, you went over, you, I think you nailed them all. Um, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, John chapter 5, verse 5, 18, John chapter 8, verse 58, John chapter 10, verse 30, John chapter 20, verse uh, 30, um, <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, verse 5, and on the way through, okay, we need to know where, and we need to know how to defend these. We need, and, and of course, the, the references to the Holy Spirit. 
when somebody assails the Trinity by telling you it's pagan, what's the first thing we do? I mean, they'll go to Tertullian, they'll go to, I mean, I mean, you guys, anybody who's been in one of these sword fights know exactly where this is going. And I like to, my first response is this. I said, you know, I understand what you're saying about the Trinity, but uh, it is a biblical doctrine. And they'll say, no, that's, you were taught that by the Roman Catholic Church. I said, okay. Now, when it comes down to defending this doctrine or discussing it, there are four questions. How, why, what, and where? How and why God is a trinity is definitely a mystery. I don't know how he did it, nor do I know why he chose to express himself this way. I don't and I cannot answer those questions. So you got me there on that side of, of the question. Maybe some of you guys can do a better job at that than I do, but how and why are definitely out there, and I just move away from how and why questions. I stay with what and where. What the Trinity is, okay, the, you know, the, within, the, within the nature of the one true God, there are three eternal persons, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are separate, and yet they are equal. And you, there's... there's there's, um, there's illustrations, but I try to stay away from that because there's a lot of scriptures that says that, 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 that there is nothing like God. There's nothing we can compare him to. So the moment you say God is like, you're already on a banana peel. So I try to stay away from God is like stuff because even though I understand it, I know it's a disaster to try to, there is nothing we can compare him to. He is, God is most adamant about this. Nothing in this universe, nothing in this creation, you can say God is like. So I stay away from those because he is like nothing else. So I asked a simple question. I said, who raised Jesus from the dead? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Now, you, we need to know these. I mean, memorize these because these are just a handful of scriptures, but man, they drive home the point and it pushes the discussion out of, out of philosophy, out of the Catholicism thing, out of Tertullian, out of all this nonsense, out of mysticism, and it pushes it right back on the pages of Scripture. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Yes. Acts chapter 3, verse 15. Acts chapter, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 3, and Acts chapter 13, uh, 13, verse 30, says that God raised Jesus from the dead. God did. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. Galatians 1.1 1, 1 says the Father raised Jesus from the dead. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. John chapter 10, verse 30. And Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says Jesus prophetically said he would raise himself from the dead. And then we have Romans chapter 8, verse 11 that says that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. We've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all active and participating in the resurrection of the dead that it says God did it. The Father did it, the Son did it, and the Holy Spirit. I said, I can't explain that. I said, but that's what it says. That's what it says. Now, we are to, to do three things. We have three commissions. We are to preach the gospel. We're to go into all the world to preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. But Paul said in Acts, or, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, he says, I am set for a defense of the gospel. So we're not only to proclaim the gospel, but Paul said, be ready to defend it. He didn't say to be ready to defend the existence of God. Notice what he said. He goes, I am set for a defense of the gospel. Most people don't even know. I'm, I'm, I can't categorize a lot of people that I've talked to ask them what the gospel is. They don't know. Get over to Jude chapter 3. We are to contend. We are to preach, defend, and contend. That's our, 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 our mission. And we are to be a witness. We are a witness. And a witness is a noun. It's not a verb. You are a witness. Witnessing is not something you do, it's something you are. Once you understand your, your role in, the, in this whole thing, you will be, 
you will be on fire when you find out, I water, I plant. I water, I plant. My job is to get it right and to proclaim it. The Holy Spirit's the one who's, who will convict and convince. Man, when I found out I didn't have to convict and convince, man, I was just, I said, wow, this, this is going to be fun. And it is. Anybody who has ever walked into a, a, um, a, 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 a hostile situation or a situation in which the gospel is denied will know that when you go in and you begin to reason with them out of the scriptures who Christ is, it can be one of the most heart-pumping, exhilarating experiences that you will ever, ever have. Knowing full well that the outcome is not based upon you because you're not the one who is convicting and convincing. And just turn it over to the Lord. Get it right. There's many more that we could go to. I've, I've ran out of time. Um, but <clears throat> just remember this. Religion, and I agree with the society on this, is a snare and a wrecking. Yes. Religion invites you to a path. That path is just a hope of something that you will never realize. I close with this. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul argues that unless Christ raised from the dead, we are of all men most miserable. If Jesus Christ came out of that grave, nothing else matters. If Jesus Christ did not come out of that grave, nothing else matters. God bless you. I have, I have some of these papers. If, if Brother Vino, would you press them? They're right there on that chair. It's a list of all the, all the identifications of what doctrine is and a list of all the doctrines. If you want to begin with an area and systematically study doctrines, these are the ones I call the red line doctrines. These are the doctrines you are going to cross swords with. Most of the time when you discuss uh, uh, something with somebody, you are, you are going to cross, you, you are going to come across the red line doctrine. And then a list of all the, the, the places that the Bible, 40 minutes is not a lot of time to talk about all of this, but it is wonderful when you understand systematically how you begin to prepare yourself for the engagements that are going to come. The engagements are going to come in a hostile arena along the red line doctrines. Know them and know them well. God bless you.